Michael P.S. Hayes is looking hungover, isn't he? That tit there missed a trick as well, you know. You cannot be Kid Rock when you're 52 years of age, man. Right there, you've got to be Man Rock. And when you think of Man Rock in professional wrestling, your mind immediately goes to Man Mountain Rock, which means we missed out on a duet, which would have happened. It wouldn't have been any good, but it would have happened. It's always a WTF moment when we see a sign with anything relating to Cultaholic on it at a professional wrestling show. And thank you to Rock Chick Chicago Red with her signs, which have a part one and a part two that reference the origins of the name redacted name. They have done their time watching this bollocks YouTube channel, therefore give them all their bloody flowers. Learning that both Ricochet and Logan Paul were having their second career matches at SummerSlam last night is a horrible stat for Trevor. And you see, that's because Spinny Trev, he signed with the WWE all the way back in January of 2018. That's like five years ago right now. And that signing happened a few months after YouTuber Logan Paul filmed a thing in a thing which ruined YouTube for every single other bugger who tried to make videos on it. Logan Paul is a wanker. And speaking of wankers, you would be one if you didn't leave this video a like and left me a comment down in the comment section down below. <laughs> if you don't do those two things, I'll send former WWE superstar Tugboat around to your house and he will shove a bottle of Logan Paul's Prime up where the boat doesn't go too toot, which means you're asshole. Now, Corey Graves pointed this out last night, but why would Samantha Irvin wear the colours of the man that her man, Trevor, was fighting at SummerSlam last night? That me phone's ringing right there. Let's hear why. Hello? All right, it's because Trevor was dressed as a Transformer and Samantha Irvin can't be bothered with that bollocks. That's fair enough. Mago, 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 mago. Knees to the face, said Michael Cole as Logan Paul bumped on his back while Trevor was trying to deliver a move to his face. It appears that Logan Paul has a face on the front of his face and also a face on the back of his face. Now I took myself to Google and a man having a face on the front of their face and a man having a face on the back of their face hasn't happened since Edward Moore Drake until everyone realised it was just an artist paper mache statue thingy and it wasn't even real. And we've got to mention it, everybody saw it, the Justice for Katie Vick sign that was seen as Logan Paul was celebrating his win over Trevor at SummerSlam 2023. Now, younger viewers, you might be asking yourselves, what the bloody hell is Katie Vick? Who is she? What does she matter to the world of professional wrestling? Well, let me from the past remind you right now. Kane's ex-girlfriend Katie Vick died in a car crash where the big red machine was behind the big red wheel. That's rough. Triple H then claimed that the autopsy showed that Kane's semen was present on Katie Vick's dead body. That's even rougher. Triple H then claimed he had video footage of Kane having sex with the deceased Katie, but instead, what we saw was Triple H in a Kane mask simulating necrophilia with a fake dead body in an open coffin. Never mind Brock Lesnar. With that massive hole right there, we almost met Cock Lesnar, the real beast incarnate. Brock Lesnar is a human being with emotions like compassion and respect and love. You can see how much he loves Cody Rhodes just by looking at his eyes. Those eyes are filled with love. And learning this about Brock Lesnar, him having emotions like a real human being, means you need to grab two each animal and head for the bastard border. The end is nigh, the end is nigh, time to run away, the end is nigh, nigh. Now when Becky Lynch's pointless mid-show promo started with her saying the line, let me remind you who the hell I am. I was thinking to myself, we don't have dementia, we don't need reminding. But then I heard that Trish Stratus and Becky Lynch's proposed SummerSlam 2023 match was cut from the card because of time constraints. A show that had half an hour of bloody adverts was getting getting rid of massive blow-off matches because of time constraints. You can't make it up. Why the hell was that the match that was cut from the show, man? All respect to the ladies involved, but nobody gave a toss about Ronda versus Shayna, did they? And Becky and Trish have been one of the biggest storylines on Monday Night Raw for the last few months now. Whose cornflakes did they piss on? Whose cup of tea did they piss in? These are the big questions we have to ask ourselves. Bronson, you drongo! You must be going round the bloody twist, putting your leg up on the rope and lifting yourself up before LA Knight has hooked your neck in the middle of an over-the-top rope battle royale. Could you be any more gagging for an early bath, you flaming galah? He is the only man who has survived a few with Bray Wyatt and lived to tell the tale. Yeah. He was left off the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Yeah. 
He was left off both nights of WrestleMania 39. Yeah. He was left off Backlash. Yeah. He was sat in the crowd like a jabroni piece of trash at Night of Champions. Yeah. He is the man who aligned the planet seemingly for a big win at Money in the Bank at the start of July, but the company didn't give him his big moment, yet he survived that as well. Yeah. But finally, WWE have given The Rock himself, yes, LA Knight, some people like to call him, but I've been calling him The Rock for about two years now, so shove that up your poontang pie. And the way Maggle Cole said LA Knight has arrived after he won that Battle Royal at SummerSlam 2023, maybe finally they're going to do something with somebody who has gotten up with the fans like few of the have over the past however many years. That line from Cole had certainly had the Kavorka pulsating through this chickadee's veins, get me a red Corvette and a leather jacket, I want a boogie. Yeah. Now I feel bad for even bringing this one up, but apparently this was the cue for the bogs inside the arena when Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler were having their MMA rules match in the middle of a professional wrestling pay-per-view. And I guess we learned a valuable lesson here. Lock them bitches in a fight pit and take that MMA shtick all the way if you want to take that MMA shtick at all onto a professional wrestling card. Otherwise, you'll have several people soil their britches. Which must have happened, by the way, because that is the longest toilet queue I have ever seen. That fly is harder and better and more skilled than every single wrestler in the WWE and maybe even every single wrestler in the world. That fly landed on Gunter's face and then evaded Gunter's hand like no other wrestler can actually do. Sign him up, WWE. I wonder if he's Spanish, he could be the Spanish fly. <laughs> A quote from Corey Graves this time when he said, Best of luck to you and Wade Maggle Cole. Three hours is a long time on Monday Night Raw. And quite frankly, if the wrong pair of ears hears that line there from Corey, it's a career ender. I mean, we should rename the jingle, shouldn't we? You're a brave man, Corey. The end is nigh, the end is nigh. Time to run away, the end is nigh, nigh. Now, Maggle Cole did Finn Balor dirtier than any other commentator has done any other professional wrestler in the history of the business because Maggle Cole claimed that thing there on Phil, uh, Phil, Phil, Phil Balor, Finn Balor's shoulder tit piece there, a tattoo. You know, a permanent thing that can only get removed with a bastard laser. I was just thinking to myself, Maggle, think it through. How could that be a tattoo when next year that seven will have to be turned into an eight and the year after into a nine and so on and so forth. Or the fact you would have to put that tattoo, if it was real, in the same category as Bobby Dazzler's like those ones. Finn isn't that much of a weapon, Maggle. And by the way, let's not forget that Seth Rollins lost the match where he wore that entrance jacket for the first time. Yeah, of course, Finn Balor got injured, but more importantly, Finn Balor also went home with the title, and more importantly than that, the winner's share of the purse. It would appear that Seth Rollins' logic here is flawed. Whoa! It's been a while since I did that, and they put me knee out. Bianca Belair is hardcore. She's drinking a fizzy drink mere moments before a massive title match, and the fact she didn't vomit that fizzy drink back up in the first five minutes of the match is the biggest WTF moment ever. Charlotte stacks Bianca Belair and Asuka in the corner. Charlotte walks to the other corner. Charlotte then walks to referee Jessica Carr and clearly asks for a lovely back scratch in the middle of a massive championship match where Charlotte Flair at the time, she was on top. And this proves to us all that there is nothing, and I mean nothing better in this world than a good old back scratch. I mean, obviously there was an issue with her gear and I just chat bollocks. I can't believe I've been allowed to chat bollocks for so long, but here we are, dear viewer. You know what to expect by now, don't you? If we know anything about professional wrestling referees, we know they are first and foremost made out of paper. And when they get hit, they stay down for about 17 minutes. Second of all, they really like counting to 10. They get positively orgasmic just by counting to double digits. And third, we know they all get confused when a professional wrestler tries to cash in their Money in the Bank contract, even though it's really, 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 really really, really clear they're cashing in their Money in the Bank contract. Isn't that right, Mike Kyoda? So to see referee Jessica Carr receive that briefcase from EO Sky and cash in that briefcase from EO Sky in the same movement, it is the biggest WTF moment in the history of this video series. Bianca Belair and her fizzy drinks be damned. 
direct quote from Corey this time when he says it's almost like he's reminding Jay your arms aren't long enough to box with God. Now I've seen three hours for Monday Night Raw is a really long time earlier in the show. Wasn't enough to get Corey Graves in the naughty books. They're referencing CM Bastard Punk. It might just do the job. And if you remember as well, who did CM Punk say that kind of line to back in the day? It was the bloody rock, wasn't it? Not the better version, not LA Knight, but the original Dwayne The Rock Johnson. The one who's not as charismatic as LA Knight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I bet in that moment as well, there were several of you at home getting your hopes up about The Rock appearing on the show last night, weren't you? Just admit it, it's fine. It's Corey Graves who's the prick. <laughs> now, if the elders made that match between Jay Uso and Roman Reigns tribal combat where the best man must win and nobody else from the family can get involved and stuff like that, why would they let Solo get involved? But also, why would tribal combat be no disqualification where Solo should be allowed to get involved? <laughs> and this is really worrying me because they're starting to do that thing WWE used to do before the Triple H Ewa. Ewa? <laughs> <laughs> the Triple H era, as the king would say over here in jolly old England. And that's because they've put a thing in storyline and then forgotten they put that thing in storyline and completely contradicted the thing they put in the storyline. Stop it, Triple H. This is very Vince McMahon of you. And now it's time to do the Bloodline storyline in the form of interpretive dance. Whee! So let's run it back. Jimmy Uso betrayed Roman Reigns at Night of Champions. Jay Uso then joined Jimmy Uso to get away from Roman Reigns and the bloodline as a whole good and proper. The Usos then beat Roman and Solo at Money in the Bank and then just after that, Roman put Jimmy in the hospital, meaning Jay went after Roman and his title of the Tribal Chief and his Uwu, whatever the hell it's called these days. But Jimmy got jealous of Jay doing the thing I guess he couldn't quite do because he was in hospital, so he attacked Jay and in the process forgot everything that Roman Reigns did to him, which included putting him in the hospital. Why didn't he attack Roman as well? Because Roman arguably has been more of an arsehole to Jimmy Uso than Jay Uso has. Jay Uso has just done things... <laughs> Now, if you boil it down really simplistically, obviously this is Jimmy Uso getting jealous of his little brother Jay and not wanting his little brother becoming the tribal chief while he is the older brother has to report to his younger brother. Let me tell you, as someone who has a little brother, I wouldn't stand for that. But as we're stood here on August the 6th, it's a Sunday. It just feels like a swerve, bro, that was done, bro, for swerve purposes, bro. But if there is one storyline in the entirety of WWE over the past however many years I want to give a chance to, it is this storyline to see what reasoning Jimmy Uso comes up with on SmackDown for attacking Jay Uso because as I say right now it feels like a swerve for swerve's sake but hopefully the reasoning makes it all make sense if they boil it just down to jealousy why didn't he attack Roman because Roman's made Jimmy's life a living hell hasn't he why did he forget about Roman Jimmy you tit so hopefully my interpretive dance of this storyline going round in circles is nothing more than nonsense and speaking of nonsense that was the WTF moments from SummerSlam 2K23 leave a comment, leave a like, and I'll see you next time.